Good evening. Good evening and, and hello, everyone. Uh, respected teachers, uh, seniors, graduates, and more importantly, students, a big warm welcome from COPS Global to this yet another fantastic webinar. And you can see the topic on the screen there. I'm Samish Tekil, an alumnus of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences to Vandrum. I finished my grad in 1997. I'm now working in global market access in a pharmaceutical company called Takeda and lives in Boston in the US. Our last webinar by Dr. Alice has hit a record number of views for us. You know, we have reached almost a thousand views. And this is, and even if I take 50% of that, say around 500 students or graduates, if they have taken one key takeaway message from those videos, that can impact their lives and careers. That's the biggest inspiration for all of us here at COPS Globe. And the views and the questions you ask during all the webinars, that shows the interest you have got in, in learning from each other. And, and please continue that. And thanks so much from COPS Global on that behalf and for making this alive and super inspirational for all of us. Well, I'm sure you have seen the topic today. It's all over the, on the screen. A bit unusual, right? When you look at the first part, uh, a philosophical line, or is Reese Reed, a vision like a title, or a, a prescription for humankind. So that makes it clear. If you are looking at this webinar to learn the courses in the US, how to write GRE, how to get an admission, you will be in a surprise. That's not what we are going to talk today. No injury. And, and he has also informed us what he's planning is, Jury will be going through his experience from Trivandrum to Toledo. How has his been experiences, what he has learned, how different or different things he has seen, the philosophical philosophy of teaching, you know, what he has learned and what he does now at the University of Toledo. And moreover, that's the gist of it, how you can transform how you can unleash your potential to get the maximum out of your life and career through academic pharmacy. Again, not just the US, you know, it's not about students who plan to go to US, it's for everyone. It's to understand how you can become a better new, better you going forward. Anyway, um, so the, the key factors, listen to it, ask your questions in the chat box. We will take your questions at the end of the webinar. Now, going into the introductions, uh, Dr. Jerry, when I was doing my BFARM in, in College of Pharmaceutical Sciences to Vandrum, again, I told it was 92 to 1997, there was this five students, you know, who had this bizarre dream of going to the US for education to, to, to do higher studies. Jerry, of course, won. There was Rudraksh, uh, there was Naveen, um, Ramdas, and myself. Only two were successful in that mission, um, Jerry and, and Rudraksh. Some guy, one of the guys who went there is Jerry. And in continuation to that journey, where Professor Jerry now is, he's a professor of pharmaceutics at University of Toledo College of Pharmacy at Toledo in, in Ohio, in the US. He's a board certified pharmacist and he teaches pharmaceutics for bachelor's, master's, PhD, and PharmD programs at the university. He has a strong publication record in prominent journals and international conference proceedings. Um, please do visit his LinkedIn page where you can learn more about his research interests, his publications, etc. An avid runner, so much a running enthusiast. I think if he's not teaching or researching at the university, he's out there running uh, um, at least seven or eight miles a day. So good that we have him <laughs> in, the, in the webinar. Webinar today rather than somewhere out, given that the uh, weather is so good here nowadays, at least in the East Coast. Going again to our fantastic and very unique, I would say, like the topic, we have a very unique panelist today. Let me go to them in the alphabetic order. So. Dr. Anil Kumar. Dr. Anil Kumar is the Vice Principal and Professor of Pharmaceutics at the Center of 
professional and advanced studies Kotayam. Dr. Anil did his B farm and M farm from Bangalore University and PhD from Delhi University. He has many research publications in peer reviewed journals and presented at various national and international conferences. Welcome, Dr. Anil. Uh, going to Dr. Dilip. Dr. Dilip, my senior at College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, is the professor of pharmacy at College of Pharmaceutical Sciences at TD Medical College, Alipura. Dr. Dilip is also holding key positions in the Kerala University of Health Sciences as the member of governing council, chairman, board of studies, member of academic council, and member of faculty pharmacy. He's also the external expert of pharmacy for the prestigious regional cancer center, Trivandrum. Proud of you, Dr. Dilip. Dr. Dilip has got one patent and published four international and seven national research articles. Again, an avid reader, Dr. Dilip is also well known for his breathtaking creations with oil paints. Uh, but even in Facebook or while uh, we were at college, those were very regulars from his side. It's my immense pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Dilip, again, my senior at the COPS to Andrew, to this webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Suri Prakash. Dr. Uh, uh, Suri Prakash is the principal at Al Shifa College of Pharmacy, Pirintalmana, the, the town where I uh, live, uh, uh, I was born, raised, and educated till 10th grade. A proud alumnus of Madurai Medical College, Bitspilani, and MGR Medical University. Dr. Suri Prakash has published more than 50 original research, authored two books, 13 chapters with major publishers, and edited four books. Impressive. Dr. Surya also owns a patent. Today, actually, Dr. Al Shifa uh, College of Pharmacy is the session's partner for COPS Global for today's webinar. And Professor Suri Prakash is also our guest of honor for today. So welcome Dr. Suri Prakash to the webinar. It's my pleasure again. We also have a student rep from Al Shifa College of Pharmacy today with us, uh, Ms. Najia Ibrahim, who is doing her sixth, sixth semester in, uh, in BFARM at the Al Shifa College. Welcome Najia Ibrahim as well to the webinar. Without doing further ado or without stealing any more thunder from the topic, uh, before passing on, one last uh, tip to the viewers in both Zoom platform as well as uh, YouTube platform. Please listen, put your questions in the chat box. We will get it and we will address those at the end of the talk. Over to you, Professor Jerry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Samish. And it is my distinct honor to be here today this morning. Uh, well, this is morning here in the US in Toledo um, and evening there in India. A, a pleasant evening to all those who have tuned in who are participating today live uh, through various means. I also feel honored to be uh, presenting or having, I rather wanted to keep this talk as as, as the term implies a talk, a conversation, as opposed to a presentation or a seminar or a webinar. Uh, and that's the style that I'm gonna assume throughout, the throughout this talk. I wanted to recognize my teachers who are participating perhaps in this program, uh, live or uh, otherwise. Um, uh, wanted to uh, uh, say a big thank you to them. And also wanted to uh, emphasize and recognize all you pharmacy educators out there who are participating in this program as well. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna delve directly um, into uh, the talk. So I have outlined my talk to discuss the uh, general academic setting in the US. Um, and the academic setting typically, you know, like a university setting will have uh, three areas of impact. One would be directed towards teaching, towards educating. Uh, other uh, would be directed towards research. And a third aspect is, of course, a very, very important aspect of service. Because that is where our universities are connected to the 
general community to the community, the bigger community in the region and perhaps the global humankind, uh, you know, through service and through that outreach activities that go on in a university setting. So these are the three different impacts, impact areas in an academic setting. And I will, as, as I progress through the talk, you will recognize that, you know, uh, the, the, the contents um, touch on each of these three different areas of impact. Um, I also will talk about uh, pharmacy education, how this, uh, it happens, uh, you know, again, a very big overview, um, nothing too detailed, uh, how education in the pharmacy uh, school is connected to accreditation and licensure. I will give you a little bit of an idea about what I do in terms of research, uh, you know, um, I've had a lot of amazing, amazing students who have taught me a lot more than perhaps what I taught them. Um, and, um, you know, a um, lot of different projects. Uh, but I'm going to talk about two very recent projects uh, that have applications, uh, one of which has applications in an applied pharmacy, clinical pharmacy, hospital pharmacy setting. And the other project is about 3D print tablets, which perhaps is being researched quite a lot um, uh, lately. And then finally, because um, of the fact that we live in, 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 in an era of constant distractions, uh, sometimes, you know, particularly for a person like me, um, you know, I, I need to stay focused. And I have found uh, some of the tools that I've picked up along the way uh, that I wanted to share with you. I'm not saying that this is perhaps the panacea for uh, the problems or the issues that we're facing, but uh, uh, some of these, uh, approaches have helped me immensely as I uh, progressed through my career so far. I'm going to begin this talk uh, by quoting um, uh, from a, a book that has had a profound influence in how I think, how I talk, and how I view things in general. Uh, the greatest scientific discovery was the discovery of ignorance. Once humans realized how little they knew about the world, suddenly they had a very good reason to seek new knowledge, which opened up the scientific road to progress. You all know Harari, uh, his, uh, you know, this, this book, Homo Deus, I, I uh, read um, uh, after, I'm trying to, okay, there you go. Um, uh, this, um, this, this book was uh, the second book that I read of you all. The first book that I read was, of course, Sapiens, you know. So uh, why did I uh, use the word ignorance? What a great way to start a talk, right? Telling that we're all ignorant. But there is an important, important message here. So the question is whether the... The, the fact that we are all perhaps ignorant at a certain level to a certain degree, um, you know, does that apply to me and you at a personal level? And I wanted to, you know, while I was putting together this talk, I started to look up um, uh, my first uh, place of employment, you know, the, my, my first started working as an assistant professor uh, out of a rented floor in this building, uh, you know, there was a startup pharmacy school uh, called University of Appalachia College of Pharmacy, which later on was named as Appalachian College of Pharmacy. And uh, this is where I started my career in, in teaching. Um, and uh, the reason why I had it there was, you know, I had it there is because, you know, this was the time when I realized all the education that I've had you know, is perhaps not just enough. A PhD, you know, I remember my advisor when I was graduating giving me a book called A PhD is Not Enough. And it's so rang true when I started working here, uh, to teach here, because it was, uh, you know, for those of you who are working in the pharmaceutical industry can relate to working in a startup company, you know, the, the same type of pressures, uh, the same type of uh, growth curve, the same type of learning, you know, the failures that you make, but at the same time, the success is very sweet. Uh, you know, those victories and those wins, um, you know, um, like accentuated by the struggle, 
uh, is what makes it all worthwhile. So, um, and um, so uh, I wanted to, uh, to uh, uh, give you a little bit of a background about this talk as well. You know, whatever I present here is um, um, is based on is based on my experiences at um, University of Louisiana at Monroe College of Pharmacy, where I was a PhD student, my uh, three years um, at Appalachian College of Pharmacy, and uh, my you know fourteen years or so here at the um, at the um, uh, at the at the uh, at the College of Pharmacy in the University of Toledo. So. Um, there is always, always, there's a reason, there's a reason why I had that poll in there is because, you know, our experiences, we all have inherent biases and then go on top of that, put on top of that, the narrative bias that can come during a conversation, during a presentation, during a seminar or a webinar for that matter, you know, take this into account. So the reason I mentioned this also is of importance in our professional lives. I mean, so the question in terms of uh, the, um, um, the, um, the acceptable uh, confidence interval in clinical trials, you know, the greatest uh, uh, number that I see there is uh, 95%. Uh, we have 99% and so on, okay? So, I skip the slide there. So the significance is that in terms of bioequivalent studies, which compares a brand product for a uh, the test product, which is a generic equivalent of a brand, brand name product, which is a control, you know, according to the FDA recommendations, the, according to the FDA recommendations, the confidence interval that is used is 90%. So the concept of cons confidence interval is that 90% of the time, according to this uh, confidence interval consideration of 90%, 90% of the time, the real value or the test value of the generic product and control product are going to be within the range of 80 to 125% of the original value. And this large variability, this large um, allocation for variability is because we deal with biological systems. Biological systems have inherent variability because there are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of unknowns when it comes to biological systems. And so on top of that, there is also this consideration, clinical versus statistical significance. You know, what is statistically significant may not be many times clinically significant because of this inherent variability that you find in living biological systems. So, Compare that to the um, uh, uh, to the fact. I want to now move on to talk about how um, university infrastructure and the university in itself is connected with the community and the region surrounding the community. The picture here, what is shown here, is about is is the. Um, is the aerial view of the main campus. You know, the university infrastructure in the US is modeled around the community. And, you know, if you think about, you know, prehistoric uh, uh, times when uh, humans were evolving, um, you know, we are talking about, you know, even before perhaps uh, weapons, uh, they were able to uh, craft tools. You know, the biggest difference at that point between the humankind and the animal world was the fact that the humankind was able to collectively get together as communities, as villages, as bands first, and then villages first later on and town, towns even later on. And that is what is modeled 
in, in, in the university setting in the US. And I also wanted to show an aerial view of the place uh, where I, uh, my office is located this in the health science campus of the University of Toledo, which is about five miles uh, down the road from the main campus. So um, in the backdrop, very back end where I'm pointing uh, in the tall building uh, is perhaps the, um, the medical, is, is the medical center uh, where we actually have, um, uh, you know, various aspects of pharmacy practice. You know, there are four floor pharmacists, uh, there are satellite pharmacies, there are, uh, there is a main inpatient pharmacy where there is uh, a USP 797 compliant IV room. Uh, and then there is the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the outpatient pharmacies where patients who are discharged from the hospital or patients who have chronic conditions who routinely have to get medications such as their anti-diabetics or anti-hypertensives go get their medications from. So all of that is part of the um, medical center as well as intricately kind of connected to the pharmacy school, which is right there uh, you know, in between those buildings. And in the foreground to the right bottom side, um, you know, we have what is the Dana Cancer Center, which is actually um, an outpatient chemo infusion center, uh, cancer care, where patients, cancer patients would come to get their IV infusions, chemo infusions, and other therapies that are necessary to treat their cancer. And so there is actually a USB 800 compliant uh, compounding facility there that will, um, you know, um, uh, uh, help uh, the students get you know trained in those aspects as well. These are all very important aspects, particularly connected to the um, to to the area that I teach in currently. You know, basically pharmaceutics and compounding. So, just wanted to point out, and I also wanted to emphasize the fact that um, um, uh, the, the, uh, you know the the, the um, the universities are a slice of humanity, and this is pretty much exemplified in that screenshot that I got from uh, got from uh, the website of our university. You know, our university represents four, you know has, has students from forty four states um, and eighty two countries. So this is a really really um, uh, diverse um, um, community of people. Uh, you know, I myself uh, was able to. Um, to, uh, to mentor, to, um, to um, advise students from, uh, students from various parts of the world, including India, various states, US, uh, Nepal, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Iraq, South Korea, and so on. And these students, wonderful, brilliant, hardworking students, you know, have contributed to my growth and to my, in, in my personal level, as well as my professional level, in a lot of ways, and I was, you know, I, I find that being uh, that that a um, that that a very humbling um, opportunity that I was given as well uh, over over these years. I want to start off uh, by um, mentioning something that is very important to um, an institution of higher education like University of Toledo. We all are required to have a mission, vision, and values statement. You know, the mission, the vision is actually the, the place where the university foresee themselves to be in the future. So the university, the vision for our university is that it will be nationally ranked, will be a public research university, which will have internationally recognized expertise and exceptional strength in discovery, teaching, clinical practice and service. And I wanted to uh, uh, point out, you know, one of the uh, one of the um, buildings in the, in the picture, in the foreground, right behind that tree. Let me see if I can find the um, pointer. Uh, how do I find the pointer? Is it the one on the left-hand corner down? I can see a pen over there. Or I, oh, I don't know. there you go. Thank you so much. You're a lifesaver, Samish. Thank you. <laughs> so the, the building in the foreground <clears throat> uh, is actually um, um, 
the observatory at the university. You know, this observatory serves a lot of different purposes. It's connected to the research activities and other instructional activities going on in the college uh, associated with the observatory. At the same time, this observatory brings in a lot of kids from the communities in our area, in our region, so that they can be uh, uh, they can experience, you know, special events, you know, astronomical, uh, uh, connected to astronomy, uh, to the space, to science and technology and so on. And so from a very young age, our, you know, university communities, our academic communities are able to bring in kids, show them what uh, is out there and nurture them towards perhaps you know, furthering their education as they progress through school, as well as having a time to get them to have an idea which direction will help them uh, fit and do much better based on their interests as such. All right, moving on to the next slide. I also want to talk about the mission, vision, and goals uh, in the pharmacy school as it applies to the pharmacy school. Again, this is a requirement as far as um, the accreditation of the college is concerned, accreditation of the PharmD program of the college is concerned. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the current guidelines that is utilized for accrediting pharmacy programs, PharmD programs in the US is what was actually cited there on that slide. ACPE represents Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education. They have the standards that, this is almost if I can draw a uh, and a, a, a similar condition that applies to uh, the industry, you know, in the industry, uh, FDA, you know, how, what role FDA plays in the industry is what ACP has to do with an academic setting, such as on the pharmacy college. And so if you, uh, I know there's probably a little too wordy and I just wanted to show you the actual screenshot of the table of contents you know there are different sections you know the first section is about educational outcomes so this is not like micromanaging what to be taught how it is to be taught but there are certain there's a framework that is provided with specific recommendations and guidelines that needs to be there so as to ensure success of the student progress of the profession um, and also how the profession can contribute to humankind to the human condition so that is the, the educational outcomes part, you know, it goes into different standards. Um, then uh, the other part is related to the infrastructure itself, the college itself. And you can see, you know, standard seven says the college should have vision, mission and goals. Now, the purpose of this is, you know, we can actually apply this towards the end of this talk. I will talk about, um, you know, how, how this applies at a personal level. This is this is important perhaps because we will, you know, vision is where we want to be in the future, where we forecast ourselves to be. Uh, mission is how we are going to get to the vision, to get to our vision. And goals is basically a set of steps, actual steps that has to be taken as part of our mission to reach our vision. And so you can see all of these different um, uh, areas, standards and guidelines that are necessary for a program to be accredited and be able to, uh, to award a PharmD degree uh, in the US. Uh, then I also wanted to um, touch on how, how, how the College of Pharmacy, different aspects of the College of Pharmacy. And one example in terms of activities geared towards inspiring future pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists is through CAMP experiences. These CAMP experiences, this is actually right now, uh, you know, uh, the, the cohorts uh, that will be participating in the summer CAMP experiences in the College of Pharmacy for this summer. In fact, you know, a week from now, uh, this semester is ending. Students are going to graduate. There's going to be a big graduation ceremony um, uh, next Friday evening um, uh, um, in, in the university, specifically uh, pharmacy college uh, graduation ceremony. And so, uh, you know, after that is summer, uh, summer semester. And so during summer, a lot of these activities, and I've had so many students in my class who have participated in these camps. Some of them already had an idea what they wanted to do. So these camps are, the participants in this, these camps 
are typically high school students. So high school here is 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So this age group is what we are looking at here. So these students uh, you know, will receive um, pamphlets or flyers or announcements about these camps um, you know, uh, from our university. And they sign up for these experiences. They come and uh, rotate through various departments, the pharmacology department, the medicinal chemistry department, the pharmacy practice department, they go through the compounding lab, all of these various aspects involved in the pharmacy college so that they can have an idea, which way do I want to go? You know, should I uh, go towards the pharmacology? I'm more of a biology, biology, I'm at the intersection of biology and science. I mean, then that pharmacology would be a great opportunity. Am I more of a chemist? Am I looking at molecules? Uh, you know, my, is my interest in chemistry, biochemistry? Then they move towards medicine chemistry. And then, you know, those who are interested in the clinical aspects, being a pharmacist, they turn towards pharmacy practice or PharmD program. So there are all these different educational programs. So these CAMs actually help students to make up their mind to decide on what they want to do and this is you know again these are uh, uh you know deeply rooted in our community connections <clears throat> then another example is um of developing innovative programming well for most recent newest programs in the college of pharmacy where i work at now is a bachelor's degree in cosmetic sciences and there's a little bit of story i mean a fascinating story about how an individual how a very gifted individual could create something that is so unique, so powerful, you know, so valuable to so many kids in our community. So the picture, I purposely took the screenshot. In the middle is Dr. Gabriela Baki. She is my colleague. She got her PhD from University of Zeged, Hungary. Now, why, how does, how, how, how do we connect in the University of Toledo and uni, uh, Zeged University, Hungary? We had an MOU um, for exchange student program with the University of Zagat. And I remember Gabby and her colleague, there were two students. Um, you know, Gabby was picked up by my dean and her colleague, I picked her up and we both drove them from the Toledo airport to their dome in the university. That summer they visited us. And they came as an exchange student and spent one summer one summer with us. And that changed her. And perhaps also we were able to reach, uh, you know, a different part of the world and make uh, a connection that is going to be long lasting, right? So Gabby now is a tenured associate professor, you know, the step before you become a full professor. And she was instrumental in developing and implementing and making the most popular undergraduate program in the university currently. One of the things about this is that, you know, cosmetic science, you know, we have learned about cosmetic science during our BFARM days. Uh, you know, we had to learn about cosmetic science. So there's a lot of connection between cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. Particularly more so because of the formulations aspect, there's a lot of connection between cosmetic science and pharmaceutics. So her background fit well, and it kind of just developed into this amazing program and project. Uh, I also wanted to talk about another aspect of the College of Pharmacy is to emphasize some service. You know, uh, a lot of uh, pharmacists who have gone through various educational programs who actually work in a pharmacy and, and, and experience um, the connection with the patients, you know, would have realized that, you know, pharmacists form um, uh, the, <clears throat> the most accessible, accessible group of practitioners when it comes to healthcare, uh, in the healthcare setting. Uh, you know, pharmacists, they, when, they're dispensing when they dispense medications, they interact with the patients, you know, in a hospital setting, uh, maybe much less so, but you know, most recently, you know, pharmacists were at the forefront of um, uh, uh, fight against the pandemic. So, um, you know, pictured here is a, is a student who will be graduating in a week. Um, some issues that were recent for- um, Yeah, no, no, I just want to raise a hand to, to do a time check. Sure, so thank you. 
Thank you. Thank the you. Half, halfway. So maybe you, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, uh, the student actually received um, um, uh, an ex excellence in public health pharmacy award from the United States Public Health Service, which is a very notable uh, accomplishment. And we have community care clinics that actually serve, uh, you know, the underserved as well as, you know, who have uh, much less access for medical care, those communities around our, 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 our city. And through work in that community care clinic, Jared was able to receive this award. And uh, I would like you to launch the po third poll now, please. Uh, the educational programs in the university, uh, you know, you know, public university college of pharmacy setting, you know, you have undergraduate programs, particularly our programs. We have cosmetic science, pharmaceutics, medicine, chemistry, um, uh, pharmacology, and uh, pharmacy administration, uh, undergraduate, you know, a BSPS, bachelor's degree. Then the professional program is PharmD, and then we have the graduate programs, which include master's, uh, in various different streams, as well as PhD. And on top of that, we also have residency programs. You know, post D, there is a big move towards obtaining postgraduate residency training. And so we do have those uh, programs in place. And those are actually accredited by, um, by, uh, by ASHP. So, Typically, we will have two distinct units or departments in pharmacy schools. One is pharmacy practice, you know, which houses pharmaceutics, clinical pharmacy, as well as pharmacy administration in our college. Then there is the basic sciences. In our college, the basic sciences are separate, two separate departments, pharmacology and uh, medicinal chemistry, just because of the fact that there's a lot of uh, pharmaceutics involved in dispensing and compounding and the connection to the practice of pharmacy itself uh, and the historic relevance um, of, of compounding, you know, during the apothecary's time, uh, you know, you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the interconnectedness between pharmaceutics and clinical pharmacy as it is practiced uh, in, um, I'm just trying to get this all to move away from the middle of the screen. Yeah, we don't see that now. I can see that in my screen. You can close it on top, top right. Let me go back and get out of this pointer. I just can't get it out, you know, just a sec. Yeah, no, it's good. Now you have the arrow. Sorry about that interruption. But um, so, um, you know, in, in the different departments, uh, the Department of Pharmacy Practice offers uh, PharmD and the residency programs and the basic pharmaceutical sciences is connected with the undergraduate sciences program, master's program, and PhD. Now, one big difference in terms of the approach, in terms of uh, teaching, uh, didactic teaching in the curriculum in these different programs is a clear distinction between the FOMD program and the basic sciences program. FOMD program, the the FOMD program, the curricular delivery, and all other aspects of the FOMD program is connected to accreditation from ACPE and NABP. These are all competencies, outcomes. You know, there are certain specific basic competencies that are required from a pharmacist and it, or for an entry level pharmacist. And so these will have to be covered in these programs. And there's no flexibility for program. Uh, program changes or programming uh, drastically in a FOMD program. However, the approach in the sciences is that, you know, this is a, a bigger uh, accreditation uh, a body that actually accredits the entire university. And so in terms of programming and delivery and teaching and the modalities followed, 
you know, we have a little more flexibility in terms of the coursework. And uh, as I mentioned, teaching modalities, you know, we can have in-person or distance learning programs, you know, uh, thesis-based or non-thesis-based uh, master's programs, so on and so forth. You know, such a flexibility may not be possible uh, uh, to the extent that, that one wishes for in a PharmD program because of the fact that there are certain specific standards and guidelines to be followed in order to maintain that ACPE, NABP uh, licensure uh, requirements. Uh, the PharmD program and one of the PharmD programs in our college is the traditional two plus four years curriculum during the two years, uh, first two years, that is after they graduate uh, from, from their 12th grade, the first two years is called pre-pharmacy, where they actually learn the basic foundational sciences, you know, physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, uh, chemistry, organic chemistry, a lot of that things that are applicable in a professional, you know, advanced years. They, they learn in PPY, PPY1 and PPY2, you know, pre-pharmacy year one and pre-pharmacy year two. And then they, you know, two plus four, in a two plus four setting, they actually, um, uh, apply to the PharmD program at, in their second year, and then they progress into your professional year one and two. And at the end of that second year in the professional program, they get a BSPS degree or undergraduate, a general degree without uh, any specialization. All PharmD students receive that degree at the end of the second professional year. Then they move on to their third and fourth years, which is where they actually encounter a lot of advanced clinical concepts. And in their fourth year, it's primarily all clinical clerkships. Um, and one thing I wanna emphasize, as I mentioned earlier, you know, for those who work in direct contact with people, whether it is you know, in, a, in a university setting, whether it is in a pharmacy setting, or whether it is, whether it is even in, in, in an industrial setting, you know, a person cannot stand alone. You are connected with teams, it will always be multidisciplinary teams. And so there is another aspect of education that you cannot literally teach in the classroom, which actually is included by various means. And that is what is listed last in that slide, you know, professional development. That is something that is built into a curriculum from day one the very first semester on, you know, one of the aspects I can mention here quickly is, you know, connected to professional development is student organizations. You know, I have been involved as a faculty advisor to our Indian student cultural organization, which was one of the biggest student organizations at the university uh, for, uh, I think, six or seven years. Now I'm actually the faculty advisor for the Amer student chapter of the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. So these students, you know, these are student chapters. I'm just a faculty advisor. They, it's a completely student-run chapter. They do the programming. They do the fundraising. They implement program. They invite the speakers. You know, I'm there to facilitate that process, um, you know, by pointing them in the right direction many times. And so during all of those programming, you know, the, 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 the student participant is actually developing themselves. And I think, you know, that is part of the uh, curriculum um, and the educational setting, and not just in PharmD. And I wanted to uh, quickly um, glance through these couple of slides. I wanted to emphasize this particularly um, with regard to uh, some of the questions that uh, were posed in the past webinars. You know, I've heard uh, questions um, uh, like, I mean, you know, will the curriculum in, in the pharmacy schools where you are, will it prepare for um, you know, is that sufficient to prepare for being a pharmacist in the U.S.? I mean, I wanted to point uh, the, uh, the, uh, the challenge in answering that question uh, by looking at these couple of slides. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but these are learning outcomes that are written for our PharmD program. As you can see, there are different expectations, you know, foundation, from foundation knowledge, practice, care, and so on. Where does all of this learning outcomes come from? By the way, all of these learning outcomes or some or you know, my courses may cover several of them or one of them. All of the courses in our curriculum will have an arrow you can draw directly from that course to one or more of these learning outcomes. Okay, now these learning outcomes do not come out of nowhere. 
these learning outcomes can actually be connected directly to the competency statements written by NABP, the Board of Pharmacy, the National Board of Pharmacy. That creates the expectations for an entry level pharmacist. You know, they are the ones who created NAPLEX and implement and, um, you know, uh, that our entire pharmacy license, licensure process is NABP domain. So you can see this is why the programming here in the US may be very different to the programs that you probably would be encountering in wherever university you are abroad. It could be quite different elsewhere in Europe, in, in, in African uh, universities, in Asian universities, in Australian universities. There will be a lot of differences because the programming will be connected to the needs in that country or in their region. Uh, now, to become a pharmacist, all PharmD graduates, regardless of where they are from, will have to pass, successfully pass NAPLEX and MPJE uh, exams. MPJE is the law exam. By the way, the law exams will be different, different states. You know, here, the pharmacy uh, setting, uh, the, the practice of pharmacy, you know, as is, the, is, a, is a case of all healthcare professions, you know, there will be a medical board, there will be a nursing board, there will be a pharmacy board for each unique state in the US and different boards may have different, you know, more stringent guidelines and requirements and regulations when compared to other states. So there's uh, a lot of uh, independent autonomy uh, and then it comes to uh, healthcare practice, but, you know, is dependent on the pharmacy law. For example, law as it is required in Ohio, is uniquely created by uh, Ohio Board of Pharmacy. They do have elements like, you know, as, as it applies to compounding, USB 795, you know, USB 797 or USB 800, uh, but each state has their own law exam. So this uh, is a requirement, regardless of where you got your pharmacy. But if your graduate degree, entry-level pharmacy degree is from abroad, they have to apply to NABP and go through the FPGEC certification program. Uh, the FPGEC certification program, uh, you know, this, I myself have gone through this in order to be licensed as a pharmacist here in the US. You know, this FPGEC program includes two exams that you have to successfully pass, FPGE and the TOEFL IBT. Now the FPGE exam is what I felt correlated to the curriculum that I had back in India, back in College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, Trivandrum. The FPGE, the equivalency exam is what I found was, you know, that exam I felt was very easy because I did study for the material for the exam. I did buy materials and study for the exam, but I felt the materials that was covered was more of a foundational basic science knowledge, you know, science aspects of pharmacy. Now in the US, uh, after you get your FPGC certification, you need to complete internship and the internship requirements will vary from state to state. In Ohio, you have to do uh, 1,740 hours internship. Uh, you know, you have to, once you complete your certification, you get the certificate and you apply for your intern license and that will enable you to do your internship in any state that you are. And then finally, after you're done with all of this, you submit all the, uh, documentation to the Board of Pharmacy in that particular state, and they will approve you to sit for NAPLEX and MPJE. And then you prepare for NAPLEX and MPJE. And I got to tell you, lately, NAPLEX has become very, very, very difficult. It, when I say it is very difficult, is it unsurmountable? No. If you put your time, if you work hard, if you get the right material and work on it, you have to dedicate time. You have to, this is not an easy exam. The first time passage rates lately have fallen. Um, it used to be over 95% national average. Currently, the national average is about 90%. And this new exam, the new model for the exam was implemented January uh, 2021. All right, now I, let me move on to talk a little bit about what I do in terms of teaching in the PharmD program. Uh, basically, uh, uh, in, in NAPLEX, there are six competency areas. 
you know, a lot of the teaching that we do has is connected to NAPLEX because at the end of the day, our graduates should be successfully uh, able to pass this exam and the law exam in order to practice as a pharmacist. So, um, you know, there are six competency areas, a total of 43 competency statements and area four and five is what I teach. And collectively this constitutes about 25% of the exam as it is currently administered. Uh, uh, so that is uh, FONDD. Now, uh, the graduate programs, I uh, am directing uh, two programs. I, I'm the director for the undergraduate uh, BSPS pharmaceutics, as well as a master's in uh, industrial, we call, we call it the industrial pharmacy. Basically it's pharmaceutics, master's in industrial. We don't have a PhD program yet. Uh, that is in the works. Uh, we are trying to get to the point that, you know, critical mass that will help us to uh, get there. So, you know, um, um, we, 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 we offer a master's program in pharmaceutics, but there are PhD programs in medicinal chemistry and pharmacology. Now, the, dis, the difference between the master's programs and PhD programs is that a lot of the master's programs currently in the U.S. do not offer assistantships, but rather, um, you know, uh, but our program offers assistance, full assistantship, which means, you know, uh, approximately the university will pay $20,000, approximately $20,000 per year on your behalf. Uh, uh, for, for your degree. Um, then uh, the PhD programs, no matter where you go, will be fully funded. Whichever university you go to the US, all PhD programs are fully funded uh, degree programs. Uh, the thing here is you will find a lot of diversity when it comes to the coursework, although the total number of credit hours will more or less be very similar, but the nature of courses, the types of courses, and the actual courses that you take may vary from university to university and programs to program when it comes to PhD. Because again, you know, there's no licensure process involved. The accreditation is much more global, higher education uh, accreditation. And it also, in other emphasizes, you know, depends on the major research focus areas. For example, University of Minnesota has a very strong pharmaceutics division, a division of pharmaceutics in itself. Uh, they were doing a lot of work on solid state chemistry. And so solid state uh, evaluation, solid state uh, chemistry studies of API and excipients and so on. And so their PhD program will be heavily oriented towards, you know, material science uh, and solid state chemistry. However, if you look at, you know, another program, University of Kansas Lawrence, um, they have pharmaceutical chemistry, you know, more of a molecular pharmaceutics, you know, things like transdermal permeation, you know, absorption. So these are all, you know, solubility, you know, core pharmaceutics concepts. So their faculty and their research is more geared towards that type of um, uh, educational and research requirements that is there in their division or the department. And then admissions have become highly competitive. And Samish mentioned earlier on about GRE and so on. There is again a lot of difference now, particularly post pandemic. What has happened is, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of universities lifted the requirements because overseas uh, applicants, you know, uh, you know out of state applicants were not able to get appointments to take GRE and TOEFL. And so a lot of universities took away that requirement. Uh, but our university, uh, unfortunately, still maintains a requirement and there's a lot of flexibility that different departments and divisions can uh, implement when it comes to GRE and TOEFL. Now, my educational philosophy includes integrating basic concepts with clinical applications. I just showed a screenshot uh, of an example for, uh, you know, how the students uh, will directly get exposed to aspects of what a medication order looks like. So that medication order is for a potassium chloride infusion. And they have to navigate through that medication order and do the needful in order to make sure that the patient receives, uh, you know, potassium chloride infusion. And so, uh, you know, one really interesting aspect is integrating basic concepts, you know, math concepts or uh, pharmaceutics or pharmaceutical sciences concepts uh, as it applies in a clinical setting. And I was also able to work on this project uh, to put together uh, uh, the uh, APHA, uh, American Pharmacists Association Complete Review for, for Pharmacy Math. And I think the working on this project was a really, really 
big educational experience for me because I literally went into a lot of websites of different pharmaceutical companies, trying to look at their products and see how calculations related to dose calculation, for example, or ingredients in there, or some really interesting unique calculations uh, related to some products um, as it is needed during delivery to the patient, for example, you know, during the process of dispensing to the patient, whether it's in a hospital setting or in a retail setting, I, I had to go and learn a lot and I just wanted to highlight. So that is also in line with integrating basic concepts with clinical applications. I also um, use a lot of technology uh, in the classroom so as to accommodate different uh, uh, learning styles of students. You know, some of the tools, screenshots are shown here, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, uh, Echo 360 Active Learning. I saw, you know, some of these polls, uh, just like those polls that were launched earlier. You know, um, Echo 360 is an active learning platform. Uh, students will be able to participate from their computer or their uh, iPad, tablet or their phones uh, uh, to actually navigate through the uh, slides in real time. And at the same time, they will have questions, polls. You know, that is actually an example you know, how, you know, from, from my lecture on combinatorial preparations, you know, what, what items are correctly, incorrectly placed in a lamina airflow hood, you know, that actually picture, I took that picture. Um, and then we also created, uh, and I create a lot of videos, it's actually me sitting there and making uh, an infusion uh, as part of instructional video, explaining how to put together an infusion. Uh, another important thing I wanna emphasize is the fact that we all fall on one, one, one of the, you know, in, in any way we look at it, you know, we, we can use, this is, a, this is an example, normal distribution, right? A normal distribution, statistically, normal distribution. This normal distribution is used a lot in a lot of evaluating performance of, you can use normal distribution to evaluate stock performance, you know, uh, how stocks perform. Uh, how, how is it connected to education study? This is how a grades, exam scores, you can plot a well-designed program. Then it is taught, the assessments, the scores of student performance will ideally fall, will be plotted, will be able to be transformed into a normal distribution. My point with this picture is, I think when I started off, I was somewhere around here, like lower end here on the left side. You know, left side is the bottom part of it. You know, at the end of my first semester here, I called my sister and I said, I'm done. I'm going home. You know, this is so difficult. I cannot, uh, you know, uh, proceed anymore. But, you know, here I am 22 years later. Right. So I was here. I was struggling a lot. I mean, it is possible for you to go from here to hear and also remember this, very important. You can be here and go here as well to the other end, okay? Be aware of that, you know, that is very important lesson that I've learned um, all these years. Moving on, you know, I'm gonna glance through some of these slides, you know, I just wanted to show uh, and, you know, and recognize the education that I got at the University of Louisiana at Monroe, it's a beautiful campus. You know, that river, uh, you know, it's called Bayou des Yard. You know, interesting um, thing is, you know, a lot of streets, um, you know, because Louisiana was part of the French uh, occupied um, or French territories, um, you, you know, before it got consolidated by British. You know, you'll see a lot of French streets. So this is Bayou des Yard. Uh, we used to rent canoes and, and uh, go on canoeing uh, down this, this yard. And I was fortunate to be, you know, uh, taught and um, trained in a lot of equipment, uh, a lot of material science equipment that actually created my later interest in research, you know, heavily emphasize, uh, emphasizing material science and materials used in formulations. Uh, so I was able to, you know, uh, be trained in laser scattering equipment, you know, weight absorption apparatus, you know, rheology, uh, you know, DSC, and so on and so forth. With this slide, what I want to say is, share with you is, you know, a very, very important factor that determined the trajectory that I took 
from my pharmacy education in, in College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences in, in Trivandrum, the medical college. You know, I've uh, put two citations here. These two were published uh, from my master's work there. And this work, you know, during those times, you know, that's why I remember, I have very fond memories of my approximately six years at the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at Trivandrum, uh, you know, because those years really set the trajectory that I would take later on. So, uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Dilib and, uh, and, um, and um, Ramdas, uh, you know, uh, paved the way uh, for, 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 for me to also think about uh, working uh, with Dr. Chandra P. Sharma and, you know, Sony, uh, we, we, we were a really strong team at that time during that master's uh, time. It was a really interesting group. And that's, you know, those, that's a learning that you cannot get from classroom, that interaction, that back and forth that occurs in a small, uh, you know, a group of, uh, of, 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 of colleagues. Uh, and it was a very healthy environment and it really propelled me. It set the trajectory for the path that I would take later on. Uh, I actually purposely also put this, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these publications there because that work will had to do a lot of it, uh, alginates and I carried that alginate work uh, to even here in Toledo. I still work with alginates uh, a lot. It's a very interesting polymer. So, you know, and a, a publication that I did from here uh, at the UT is from here. There are a few other works that I as well, uh, you know, this is another publication, again, completely based on alginates uh, where we developed a method to prepare alginate nanoparticles, you know. Um, uh, so just wanted to show how things that we do, right, long time ago, can influence what we work now and you know the projects that we do now. Uh, and uh, for the next, uh, we have about six minutes left. Um, you know, I think I'm going to skip through some of this research stuff. Um, but uh, suffice it suffice <laughs> suffice it to say at this point, you know, this was a project uh, in, in involving developing. Uh, computational systems that are useful in compounded store preparations. Uh, this originated uh, while uh, I was a pharmacy intern in the inpatient pharmacy at the University of Toledo Medical Center. And, you know, I've rotated, I was a, an assistant professor at that time, and I've rotated through all the different uh, aspects uh, of uh, internship, you know, uh, stocking crash cards, you know, inventory and crash cards, unit dosing, packaging, uh, automatic drug dispens, so on and so forth. And then I was also able to get training in the IV room, which really uh, 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 helped me a lot because I teach that in my pharmaceutics courses. And I was able to actually make uh, those compounded preparations that were eventually used in patients at the hospital. So, and that practical experience gave me a lot of confidence and educated me and opened the doors uh, for me to explore this topic in detail. And so, you know, uh, the requirement is that all of these different aspects of compounding, you know, USP 795, non-store compounding, uh, USP um, uh, USP uh, 797, um, the poll is actually uh, uh, this out of the way. Well, what's the jury? Can I help you? Yeah, I got it. So all aspects of compounding um, is covered by these three general chapters, USB 797, uh, USB, um, uh, USB 797 is related to, you know, all the guidelines that later become enforced uh, material when it is taken by a particular board of pharmacy, state board of pharmacy. Here I've shown screenshots of Ohio Board of Pharmacy website, the laws and administrative rules as it applies to drugs compounded in a pharmacy. So the first A says, all non-store compounding should use 795. All 
stone preparations should use 797. All hazardous compounding, hazardous materials like chemo products should follow USB 800. So once these USB chapters are referenced, are taken by a board of pharmacy and included as the law and administrative rule related to that aspect, then it becomes enforceable. And so, uh, you know, that is why it is so important uh, as an important, that, that one of the reasons why it is very important. And one of the problems that occurred at that time was a major scandal uh, because of a, a, a contaminated uh, steroid injection that was compounded in this particular compounding pharmacy uh, called New England Compounding Center uh, in Framingham, Massachusetts. It led to the death of 64 people all across the US, you know, 23 states. It was a major, major shocker. You know, think about this. This is a country from where you are sending Mars rovers to, Mar you know, to Mars and remote controlling it like a video game. And, you know, uh, uh, we are sending rockets to space and bringing it back in one piece. And here you go, people dying from contaminated injections. So this was a major shocker. A lot of people, a lot of stakeholders came together. The government, the practice community, students, professionals, regulators, you know, uh, the community spokesman, all of these people came together uh, during that time and it created kind of a national attention. And that is one. And there's also numerous stories. You know, you can go to Institute of Safe Medication Practices, ISMP org, and you know, look at the the uh, the adverse effects, you know, as well as error reporting and so on and so forth. And you would see so many other examples. You know, here's an example for uh, a, a child who, uh, uh, you know, instead of being given a normal saline-based infusion by accident, you know the infusion was hypertonic saline. So you can imagine what could have happened and she passed away. And so I delve deeper into the various problems associated with still compounding and found that a lot of that stuff is still manual. And that what actually led uh, me to collaborate with my then collaborator, Dr. Vijay Devukhani, who is a computer science expert, much smarter, an intelligent guy than me, I would not be able to do uh, much with computers other than doing a presentation. <laughs> but uh, they wrote the program. Basically what we did was we distilled the information from USB 797 that is relevant for preparing safe and uh, um, uh, correct compounded cell preparations. You know, we took a few sample example compounded steel preparations, distill the information from 797, USB 797 that is relevant and created this software, which had a lot of artificial intelligence based algorithms um, in, involved in it. You know, we, um, we, um, um, we designed materials uh, selection system, component detection, you know, uh, Basically, how do we do this? We have a software that is capable of recognizing things that are kept inside a laminar airflow hood. You know, we have a camera and the same type of image analysis that is used in, uh, used in, uh, used in, um, used in any type of imaging, uh, you know, camera-based technology platform. You know, something like face recognition. Instead of face recognition, here we have a program that is capable of recognizing accessories, products, all of that that was placed in a laminar airflow hood. So uh, this was a really, really interesting project because you know, we um, you know, uh, were able to travel all across the US um, to various hospitals, small, medium, and large hospitals uh, you know, to see, actually see what they actually do in terms of compounded cell preparations. And so um, at the end of this, you know, um, lately, while I was actually researching materials to put on this, um, uh, we have two robotic systems at that time, which is about, you know, 2017, 2017 timeframe, we only had one robot, which is the Riva robot that is shown on the right uh, of that slide. Um, it's completely self-contained robotic system uh, that meets uh, all clean room requirements that are necessary in, in compounded cell preparations. And uh, the other is a more recent 
product, which is an OmniCell uh, IV uh, X station compounding robot. And there are also, you know, what are called uh, software platforms. You know, on the left is the BD Pixis IV prep, you know, something that we developed is more similar to this, you know, but BD uh, Pixis IV prep, uh, the product on the left uh, that is actually placed, you can see it is placed inside the IV hood actually uses gravimetry. So this is actually a metal Toledo balance, electronic balance that is connected to a camera system uh, that is capable of detecting materials, taking pictures, and then sending it to, uh, uh, you know, uh, records uh, so as to, you know, uh, be available for auditing later on. So that is one type of gravimetry. And then one of the earlier systems was NetKeeper, which basically used a stand and an iPad that is placed, you know, uh, uh, appropriately, um, you know, in the IV hood, so as to take images. And then basically the technician will navigate through these windows as they put together this IV infusion. All right. So I'm going to skip through this uh, uh, because, uh, you know, this is a more recent project. You know, there's a lot of interest in 3D printing. There are two products that are FDA approved. One of this is on the left, uh, you know, Spritum, Levitericetum, uh, you know, it's a seizure medication made by Apresia Pharmaceuticals in Ohio. Uh, on the right is uh, a product uh, that was most recently approved, um, uh, an IND was approved, not product, an IND was approved uh, for this. Uh, this is uh, from a, for a Chinese company's product. And so, uh, you know, the, the approach with this is very different. You know, it's almost very similar to how, what you can envision when, it, when you think about a printer. The printer is connected to a computer. Uh, basically, the printer has materials that will be converted into various shapes. And that is what is fascinating about this process. You can create a lot of different kinds of shapes and study a lot of different types of processes, you know, diffusion, dissolution, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, we, use, uh, we used SolidWorks, which is for, uh, pretty much was the standard software that was used to design these. You know, we can design different shapes, you know, design tablets and cylinder shape and, you know, printed those tablets. You know, the thing is that we use PVA, and there's some limitations as to what materials we could use. And on the right, you can actually see the tablets that we printed. We subjected these to various quality control tests, including a scanning electron micrographs, just to show you a visual idea about what this matrix looks like. Um, you know, and we are continuing to do a lot of work with 3D print tablets. And now the next part, I want to quickly, I hope I, 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 I spend more time on this part. You know, many times we think our lives are like that in the picture. You know, everyone is perfectly lined up. You know, you did a ton of practice, uh, but then we are surrounded by chaos and unexpected events that can occur in our lives. And I think some of this, uh, uh, approaches in, in, in the next few slides, I, I think, helped me understand what are the challenges lying ahead? How should I prepare to meet those challenges? And how am I going to meet those challenges? One of the things, practice makes perfection. Find time. You know, I have put citation from where I got some of these ideas. And some of these ideas were, that I received through uh, a training program that we all did. Uh, as part of the uh, professional development program, leadership development program at the college. You know, Outliers was a book. I mean, you, and I put those there deliberately, purposely, so that those of you are interested can maybe do your own research and some groundwork. So practice makes perfection. Uh, another thing, we all tend to become very comfortable. You know, think about that untethered spacewalker uh, out in the space. You know, picture yourself in a situation like that. You know, you have to force yourself to get out of the comfort zone in order to, uh, uh, in order to do real learning. You know, one of the most important impediments, barriers for learning is the fact that, you know, we are a little probably scared to get out of that comfort zone. Then deep work. That picture explains it all. You know, and my friends who are probably participating, who are familiar with me, who are participating in this event, probably knows about this about me. I may show up briefly and then disappear from social media because I have put certain uh, uh, limits in terms of what my involvement and in, in social media or other platforms are concerned. And I got that philosophy directly out of that book that I've put there. Uh, Cal Newport, uh, again, another professor, uh, young professor um, wrote that book and it, it, it's a really valid book. And, um, 
this just this topic about personal mission statement, you know, how uh, I mentioned about the importance of a mission statement earlier on at the beginning of the talk, you know, how uh, uh, that is so important, uh, how that sets the direction uh, of, of an organization, the same way consider this personal mission statement as a roadmap that will create or give us an idea about which path, what path are we going to take? You know, this came about uh, through uh, the use uh, of this particular book, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know, content from that book uh, in, in that leadership program that I mentioned about earlier. And one of the things was, you know, how to effectively manage time and, uh, you know, uh, how to categorize, you know, uh, your most urgent needs, not urgent needs, urgent needs, uh, you know, not urgent needs, which can all the further be categorized into whether it is important or not important, create a, how you can create a quadrant and populate these boxes with things that are uh, gonna be helpful in deciding what time is to be allocated to what event or project. Uh, and when you are looking at time management, you can also think about packaging time that you have. We all have 24 hours. So one interesting technique uh, that uh, gives us adequate opportunity to rest and rejuvenate uh, in between long stretches of time that we have to put in a lot of hard work is the Pomodoro technique for me. And different people can use different methods. You know, I use 50 minute Pomodoro techniques. That means I time 50 minutes, take a 10 minute break, another 15 minutes, 10 minute break like that when I am uh, focused at doing something. Uh, okay, uh, there is some scientific basis behind this. So, uh, you know, uh, I just wanted to put that out there as well. And finally, 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 I uh, wanted to thank you all for patiently listening. And I'm very sorry, I apologize for going way overboard the allocated time. I start with my family who have provided me with the resources, you know, my father who was a role model, my wife, my kids, my, uh, my, uh, my aunts, my uncles, my sister, um, you know, all of them were instrumental and particularly this school on the left is a picture of the school that I went to and I can't have to emphasize this thing that school and the picture on the right is the St. Xavier's College that I studied uh, four years, you know, two years pre degree and two years BSc physics before I started pharmacy school, right here, you know, pharmacy school right there in the middle on the right, you know, those two educational institutions, I think help helps continues to help a lot of people who live in that coastline, you know, along those coastal areas, so many people have been touched by their mission for providing education and a future for our families and our communities. And I'm deeply thankful for my teachers, my mentors, my colleagues, my friends, and all the students that I've interacted with. My students who continue to teach me, who continue to challenge me to become a better person every day of my life. I have to thank COPS Global, and this is amazing, you know. Uh, last year, I was in the middle of a lot of, lot of uh, time, you know, other constraints when it comes to time, and I was not able to participate much in you know, during the beginning of this 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 platform. But I was there, uh, you know. I heard the discussions. I was passive viewer. But guys, this is amazing, uh, you know, a platform to share. Just have a conversation, this conversation, that's what is most important, I think. And I enjoy that. And I want to thank everyone involved in this uh, to, for, for giving me the opportunity, giving me this platform to talk about, uh, you know, share my experience. And thank you all for patiently listening. Thank you. Thank you, Jury. It was, it was amazing. The, the time, whatever you took is definitely worth <laughs> the, the extra time, you know? Um, so uh, maybe I think some of the things which I took away, uh, you, you rightly mentioned about how the system or the educational system in the US is. You talked about how, if you look at a university, it's not a standalone piece, but it's kind of a community setup where the people in that university, be it students or teachers or or faculty, they are having a cross-functional approach over there where you are, you are dealing with the end customers, you're dealing with multiple stakeholders in, the, in, the, in between. 
you are opening up new challenges wherein in one of the slides you mentioned the the students set up most of their initiatives they take control and responsibilities including but raising budgets sometimes so i think that those those are those amazing pieces where the development is more focused overall it's not about getting a degree or a phd as you also mentioned in another in your beginning of the talk but it's about an overall development and transforming it right and and that's the beauty of how the philosophy of education uh, at least in the us is um you again i should tell you the last around five to six slides where you mentioned about that how to focus in the clutter or chaos those are amazing pieces i think that those are actually equal to reading seven or eight books which you mentioned you are taking the gist out of those i think at least personally i need to i need to view those again and even even if i can take just one slide out of that and practice that's going to change a lot that's going to impact a lot so i definitely urge the students and graduates who are watching this to maybe relook those and there are quite a lot to learn from there uh, especially in time management and focus and having a mission in front of you those will help a lot uh, believe me when you when you plan things and when you where you are at your stage of career or life right now uh with that i i well, I, i am opening up the uh, q and a part of it so before getting into the questions um maybe i i pass it on to our student rep on the call today um uh, uh, miss miss najia ibrahim uh do you have any questions before we jump into other students or other questions we have uh yes sir good evening uh, myself is najia and i'm a sixth semester student of al shifa college of pharmacy uh sir could you please explain me about the general procedures to get into a university in us uh, for ms and pharma okay so uh the general procedure you know first of all you have to go to the university website the college website you know masters program i'm assuming you're looking at masters program in a in a us university you need to go to the college of university website by the way um we will get back to some of those polls answers so there are 141 colleges of pharmacy uh in the us currently so not all of them have graduate programs okay master there but a lot of them do have masters programs so go to their website and this is why you would see a lot of difference between different university but there are a few common things that i can tell you almost always there will be a formal application process and in that formal application process there will be test scores involved you know there may be universities that do not need any test scores but the test that i'm talking about is gre and toefl okay then other than that of course your academic transcripts uh and uh when you submit your academic transcripts you know when i was applying at that time we did not have that you know now i think you could do uh, educational credentialing services could convert your transcript because the marks that you see in your scorecard right or the scorebook or what is it um mark sheet uh, i'm not sure i'm sorry i mean you know the all the, the marks that you get from different years that is slightly different here it's gpa so uh th th there may be a need for doing that at that time we needed to do that i'm not sure if now you know it's been 22 years later so that transcript you know your academic performance will be looked into okay gre scores your academic performance currently where you are doing your education then the third thing is uh letter of recommendation uh you know who, because you know um that is a very important aspect in all different programs here actually you know there will be letter of recommendations as required so some of them uh could come from your teachers if you have uh if you work uh then maybe your supervisor can provide one letter so typically you would need three letters of recommendation uh to uh, in your application then another thing is um is uh almost like what do you want to do what is your vision uh, when it comes to research why do you want to get this graduate education 
right? What is your purpose with it? Uh, statement of purpose. So uh, there are a lot of boilerplate templates <laughs> that we see uh, when it comes to these things, but then those things that stand out, right? When you read, you can see sometimes then, because I, I'm the director of the master's in industrial pharmacy program, I can tell you, you know, a lot of the kids have more or less similar GPAs, okay? Most of them have very similar, like, applications that make it to our, like there is a pre-processing with your application material before it gets to our college. You know, the graduate admissions office in the university will do that. Make sure that you have the right scores, right TOEFL score, right GRE score, right GPA, all of that. Stuff. All of that is more or less in the same level. What sets you apart are some of these things, you know, how you have, how eloquently you have put across your vision for yourself for tomorrow, that's important. Another thing is, although marks are important, on top of that, if you can show that you were passionate about your education, you know, by way of, for example, this is great, you are participating, you know, today, Sunday night, you could be sitting in front of the TV, you know, relaxing, right? But you chose to participate in this webinar. You know, that's, you know, participating in these programs, you know, professional programs, professional development programs, uh, involving in organizing things, you know, student leadership, professional activity, all of this are important. Uh, now things have become very competitive. You know, we get a ton of applications and, you know, these are some of the things that will set you apart. And then um, is there anything that I'm missing in the application process? But these are the few elements. Test scores, your application, you know, and, you know, another thing, uh, if there are deadlines associated with these applications, make sure that you meet those. You know, that is very important because these are electronically set into the application handling system. A tight deadline, deadline will be there and it'll be just done. You know, the button to submit will be gone, you know, after that time point. Uh, but a lot of universities also use what is called rolling admissions, which is when they find a good applicant, they'll offer you know, no matter what time uh, it is, provided they have the funds. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Thank, thanks, Najia. Is it, do you have anything more, Najia, or are you okay? No, no, I'm okay. You can go with the rest of the questions. Yeah. Um, Juri, we have, we have almost a similar or a little bit more specific a question in the, in the, in the box. Which is, which is asking in line with Najia's question, it is also asking what can make it more compelling because you mentioned about all the usual stuff like the scores, recommendation letters, statement of purpose. But at the end you showed, you told, how can you convince that you are so passionate on your, on your studies and on the program or, or specific university? How do, do, can you throw some examples uh, how can you make it more compelling or are there anything as, as a admissions director you have seen which really uh, puts you like, okay, this is the guy whom I want in my college? See, I forgot to mention another equally important thing <laughs> uh, at, along with your application. <clears throat> Developing a connection with the person mm -hmm. who is responsible here, you know, that is so important. If you have, you know, we encourage our students to build their network from the get-go. That is so important when it comes to finding your future employer network. Whether it is a beginner or whether it is, you know, a person like me, you know, what is my next career goal? I mean, if I want to advance, you know, to another career, you know, another position in my career, I need to have a network. So please, that is so important. Connectivity with, you, with, with, with former graduates of your colleges who are perhaps in, in the U.S., if you are thinking about coming to the U.S., you know, connecting with them, finding out, learning about more, and maybe connecting. In my case, you know, I can tell you, I was perhaps the first student from the University of Kerala in the pharmacy college at the University of Louisiana at Monroe. 
So University of Kerala did not have a name recognition there, okay? There were students from a lot of other universities, you know, why? Because once you have a student in pharm PhD pharmacology from UDCT, Bombay, they are connected with students, their juniors, right? And they, whenever it's time for someone to apply, they apply uh, through this channel. And then their friend will be able to perhaps go and meet directly and talk to the advisor who is seeking a graduate student. That is also an important aspect. Uh, but going back to your question about, so emailing and trying to develop a relationship very early on, you know, this does not happen like, you know, I get tons of emails just like out of the blue, right? Uh, when it's close to decision time in terms of admissions, you know, that's too late for me to have that relationship. You know, I would have had this conversation going on with the student who emailed me a year ago or, you know, two years ago, you know, you, you know, name recognition, important. So uh, that's, again, going back to getting out of your comfort zone. Maybe you're not really comfortable. Make the mistake of going and approaching people, sending emails and developing a conversation with them uh, that'll help you to develop that direct connection. In my case, when I applied, uh, you know, I used to email uh, Dr. Bill Colling, who was my major advisor while I was doing my master's there. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he, you know, I was, I was in connection with him through emails. I, I connected with him during that time. And there are, you know, I have to say this at this time, you know, I would, although not directly related to your question, uh, you know, uh, but maybe I will get back to that later. But the, um, the key thing is having a very strong application, having a very good track record, academic track record, performing really well, not just in your academics, but additionally to that, you know, what would we call extracurricular activities, organizational activities, leadership activities, community activities, you know, mm -hmm. all of those actually point to your leadership skills and your involvement in things out of the academic, academic environment. It gives a sign that you are, you know, at the end of the day, no matter how skilled or how much of an expert you are, if you cannot get along with people, it's gonna be extremely mm -hmm. hard. So all of that gives the impression that this person is actively involved with people. And so all of those, you know, things that you don't get from a classroom are equally important. In fact, more important uh, because at a basic, I shouldn't say more important, you shouldn't make that qualification. But once you have made that bar, what sets you apart are all of these different things. I'm not sure what kind of opportunities are available, uh, you know, at, at this point. You know, in my, in our case, right, Samish, uh, you know, we had that, um, we used to organize uh, events. I mean, those were really amazing times. We literally, you know, were on our motorcycle, going around the communities, yeah. advertising, raising funds, uh, you know, putting together the program, you know, in a lot of ways, those things really made me get out of the shell. You know, I was not confident. I, these were opportunities where you go there and get thrown out of your store yeah. <laughs> or asking money for a program. You know, these really, you know, you fall. You literally got slapped in the face because they go yeah. away right? because you're bothering them. So those were opportunities for us to learn a lot of interpersonal skills. I think, I, I think Jerry, Jerry the, the, this is fantastic. And this is exactly the moment I'm, I'm pretty keen to hear from our panelists because they live and breathe every day campuses like you and they see students around and it would be great all three panelists if you can tell like uh, how do you see those opportunities where kids learn out of the uh, uh, curriculum and what do you expect as as teachers and professors and principals how do you, what do you expect from from the students yeah uh, samish thank you i, I was just uh, expecting when to just peeping. But yeah. before that was a Jerry, that was a really outstanding session. That really it was an outstanding session. Uh, initially, when you started with a list of topics, I was really wondering how you could complete uh, in time 
period which we already decided to complete in our uh, earlier shows but you did a wonderful job you never missed a important point not a, even single important point you covered everything so really amazing thank you professor jeri was really wonderful and particularly the farm d difference between uh, uh, india and usa we know what do we do here in india but normally what people think think here as a farm d graduate or any colleges in farm d americans also study the same thing but now you thoroughly showed what is the syllabus in usa what do we study here in india so it's a lot of catch up to do lot of lot of catch up to do just the name is not name may be same but beneath the name everything is totally different so again uh, that point also i'm really very happy you clearly explained the farm to program in usa thank you professor jerry and with regard to uh, um uh, mr samish uh, see actually the thing is here now uh, the students um, particularly in kerala are very well placed when compared to our same farm d graduates in other states even in tamil nadu or any other north indian states here the students have a lot of opportunities to get a job in hospitals right now the aspiring most of the farm d students fifth and sixth year interns they aspire to go to united states united states and there also i uh, saw professor jerry gave fine points how to fine tune their uh, applications to go to us and that also i am really very happy and unfortunately i couldn't see many students are uh, listening but anyway that is there in the youtube once again we can ask them to go and listen all these points so wonderful session professor jerry and really very happy to be part of this one i should thank prashant also for bringing me in and also i thank other other of my friends panelists and my student as you also thank you very much thank you thank you doctor yeah dr anil or deepak uh, dilip yeah first of all uh, let me thank uh, dr uh, professor jerry Uh, for his wonderful uh, talk on the uh, prospects of indian students in us and he has explained uh, most of the, uh, the the hardships they faced uh, in to reach us and find a very good uh, university of their choice and one fine thing i have noticed from my department is many many of my senior students or previous students alumnus are in us and uh, professor jerry has already mentioned few names uh, yesterday we had a discussion and nowadays what we have seen is uh, there is a number is uh, reducing uh, the students who is going to us is reducing and uh, people are going to uh, uk canada canada is the destination place they thought so uh, i don't know what exactly the reason is might be the the uh, the universities they they opt will not get the uh, they will not give the admission to them or uh, the ease of getting admission to places like canada and many of my students are in us that is that is of sure but the, the recent trend is changing and uh, So, Jerry, can you please explain the reason why uh, it is happening? Sir? Yeah, I'll tell you. I that's so true. <laughs> that is so true. We see that. I mean, I can tell you right now there are three students in my lab. One student from Benin, Africa. Amazing guy. He's a Fulbright scholar. He taught me a lot of things. Amazing guy. Benin from Benin, and two students who are from Michigan, right next door. So you see, there are not a single Indian student in my lab now. This has been the trend over the past several years. I mean, when I uh, started my PhD, there were sixty students, graduate students, in the College of Pharmacy there. I think majority of them were Indian students. But now the proportion of Indian students must have come down. I'm predicting because that's been a national phenomenon. What has happened over the last? 10 years or so i think roughly around you know post that recession right that 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 time when you know lehman brothers failed in you know, 2007 2008 2000 around that 2010 time frame 
there's been a lot of interest in students, domestic students, to go into these pathways. So we do see an increased domestic applicants, number one. And so, and there is also, um, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, it has been difficult in terms of going, navigating through the immigration process here in the US. You know, I had to wait years to get my green card, you know, although I had a PhD, right? There was a difficult process, but, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of, I mean, it, it, could, it, didn't, it didn't have to be that difficult because, you know, I could have used another pathway which eventually was used and, you know, uh, uh, you know, there are different pathways through which you can get your green card. And that was, I think, been an impediment in terms of, you know, someone who is uh, thinking about overseas education, not many of them are thinking about going back. You know, they're thinking about, uh, you know, immigrating eventually. And so that is also another thing you have to think about. And I think if there are a few of these factors that you know, contributed to that. And I believe Canada may be a little more open in terms of navigating through the immigration system. You know, um, I know personally know a few people who did their PhD here uh, from a US university. And after they completed, uh, you know, they moved to Canada uh, to work and live there and vice versa. There are people who lived in Canada, they moved to the US as well, that happens. But that I think may be one of the contributing factors. But let me tell you, if you come here as a student and uh, you, you know, excel in what you are doing, we could, you know, that, that person could uh, address some of those deficiencies that, that, that someone may face as you navigate through the immigration pathway. But, um, you know, that I think is a contributing factor. There's a lot of domestic student competition. Another thing is perhaps a more complicated immigration process uh, in the US. These two may be contributing, I have a feeling. Uh, thank you, Jerry. And uh, one more thing I wanted to discuss is uh, now the students already we have mentioned it, they're focused uh, for uh, the, the, the mass media uh, softwares, all those uh, parameters. And uh, the, the main criteria that is community service they're lacking. The students, uh, they don't go for community practice. They, they are something reluctant to do that. And another, another thing is, uh, even if they do also, they will, they will uh, make it something like uh, they wanted to show off, they will take some photographs and finish it. That's all. And how can we come out of this? Any, any uh, even the leap sir is also there. We can contribute to certain uh, points to that. Can I? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Anil, for uh, raising that point. And uh, before starting that, I would like to uh, say that it was a wonderful session, Professor Jerry. And uh, you have mentioned a lot of points. And I think uh, from your presentation, uh, some points uh, I catched upon. First one is that the students needs a mission statement. I think that lacks in our students. They are just trying to get a pass mark in the semesters. And that's one point. And uh, second point, I think that they need to have a vision of their themselves. That's also very important. And also uh, their passion about uh, their education. Uh, th these points will make them different from the co-applicants, as you have already mentioned. And another point is that at this point, I would like to uh, have some memories about our UG and PG courses in College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. I think we were the group that have created one association for MPharm at that time. Yes. Kerala State <laughs> MPharm yeah. Pharmacy, Pharmacy Association. See, that is a part of, as you have said, a part of leadership and how you can act in a team. That is also very important. And also I remember that at that time, 
Jerry, as he has already mentioned, a lot of books for reference. He usually was a voracious reader. <laughs> and also, he, he was planning to go to US. At that time, he was going to, uh, I think, to what uh, that uh, to study the Fran uh, French. I was from French. Yeah. Every evening when we were we were involved in some sports and all, he was going to study French. <laughs> so, <laughs> plan. so I think that, that means, thanks to Bishi. Thanks to Bishi Jeev. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, of course. A lot of people, and, man. Seriously, you look back and look at all of those things. Yeah, now I can see that at that time he was sharpening all his arsenals. And that is why now he's there where he where he is <laughs> so that is a that's an in, a very very uh, interesting thing and uh, in that um, in the in this presentation i think you have mentioned about 3d of the tablets and i think that is the future that's coming out and there is only two products that is approved and what makes it a very big challenge to get approval for these products Is that question directed towards me? Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> we found a lot of interesting things about this. There's a lot of, there's a long road ahead for that, okay? <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> every time, right? Even aerosol, if you go back to aerosols, aerosols were originally introduced in the agriculture sector for spraying pesticides. <laughs> It took a long time before it became a human product, okay? Same thing is what is happening now with 3D printing. Um, I think it remains to be seen what area it will become really prominent because see, we are talking about tablet machines that can tap, compress, you know, 100,000, 150,000 tablets a, an hour, okay? right? A huge number of tablets, but a 3D printer is not able to handle that type of capacity. So the application for 3D printing technology currently, I mean, I've, um, in, in, in fall 2019, November 2019, right before the pandemic, one of my last uh, long, uh, you know, domestic trips was to San Antonio uh, at the AAPS uh, annual meeting. And, uh, there, there were so many sessions on 3D printing and uh, I listened to uh, a lot of the pioneers in 3D printing and they all shared their challenges with this. So 3D printing originally, as you can imagine, was developed by chemical engineers, material science engineers. So the technology as it is, exists now is suitable for handling materials that are amenable in an engineering setting. However, you know, the materials that we handle, right, have to be, first of all, I mean, when it comes to, uh, you know, in something like that, you know, formulation development here and all the projects that I do, you know, one of the first things that I tell my graduate students to look for is look at ingredients specifically that are in the grass list, you know, generally regarded as safe list, as an FDS grass safe list, grass list. And we try to include only those compounds that are on the grass list. And so the limitation is the materials right now and the technology. And I'm pretty sure, and that is one of the areas that I'm interested in looking at, adopting materials that are amenable for 3D printing that will be able to give more flexibility for that platform. Uh, that is absolutely necessary, I think. And that would probably also drive uh, modifications to the existing technology. That is also necessary the technology, right? It has to be modified uh, in order to meet the, uh, meet the requirements. It will get there because again, I use this example of aerosol products. It got there, you know, right now we have an in inhalable insulin product, a freezer, right? Inhalable in insulin product. Uh, there is, uh, although it's an intranasal uh, powder, uh, but uh, not intranasal, uh, inhalable powder, uh, you know, it's a DPI along the lines of, you know, adware, uh, you know, those, you know, or, you know, all of those products that are dry powder inhalers. So it took a long time 
Same thing also with coating process, you know, coatings, right? Tablet coatings, a really important field because, you know, and bead coating, a lot of products, you know, uh, for example, uh, products that are uh, labeled as abuse deterrent pain medications, they use specific technology to prevent abuse of opioids and pain medications. And those, that coating technology was originally it originated in paints, right? I mean, the paints, those materials cannot be used in, 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 in human products, in pharmaceuticals. So it took a long time to get to the point that there were enough materials that are capable of being used in pharmaceutical dosage forms. So I think it's going to be a natural progression. Right now, I think what we are witnessing is the early stage. We have one product. Eventually, look at that, another perfect example, biotech products, right? Monoclonal antibodies. 10 years ago, we could count in our fingers how many products were monoclonal antibodies in the market. Currently, that is the biggest growing segment in the industry, right? I mean, biotech products, large molecules, you know. So there are a lot of challenges, you know, look at the vaccine the technology that is used in the vaccine, lipid nanoparticle, right? Lipid particles. The RNA was encapsulated in lipid particle. Now, I wanted to include that part also because I did a little bit of work in lipid, not that that's a big thing, big deal, but you know, it's, it's interesting. I found a lot of challenges at that time, but I know I didn't have that much resource in order to fine tune or refine the, the product that we had or the process that we had, but you know, pharmaceutical companies uh, had the budget and the money and the resources you know, the lipid particle, the thing is that the lipids that we use, right, has to be biocompatible. So they are using biocompatible lipids uh, that are compatible. Uh, and we did cell testing and we found a lot of, you know, uh, issues. And we had to narrow down the choice in terms of materials that we could use in our lipid particles. But then that created larger particles. You know, we cannot keep the size down. So all of these challenges, I think, it'll get there. But... Um, like you said, it is difficult to get through the approval process. And I'm pretty sure those of my colleagues mm. and friends who are in the industry can relate to that. You know, what a struggle, what a process that is, the regulatory framework connected to this. And so all of these, I think eventually uh, uh, will help to actually uh, uh, generate more interest, of course, and more resources and perhaps come up with more ideas where it can really be applied. I think you know, to that, that. one of the things that I saw I forgot to mention that well, that meeting was a group from Spain. They were actually developing, uh, because there are a lot of diseases that are very, very rare, extremely rare, and they don't have commercial products available for that. <laughs> but then the governments of these countries, various countries, for example, in the US, you have a specific governmental setup to encourage research in rare diseases, you know, developing treatments for rare diseases. So uh, one of the things that we're exploring was use of 3D printing platform to develop viable formulations for rare diseases, rare genetic diseases. So, you know, so it's probably, you know, initially it's going to be niche market, I think, you know, niche areas. And as and when the technology perhaps increases or improves, it probably gets adopted and, you know, goes in different directions. But I think it's very early stages now, I believe. You know. Yeah. I and hope I answered the question with such a big explanation, but. Okay, Jerry. And uh, one more thing. Uh, I'll see you have pointed in one slide that you should come out of the safe zone. That's right. But uh, as a person like me, like to be in the safe zone. The question is, <laughs> yeah. please don't that. Is there any online programs offered by the universities? For universities. Hmm. There is no structured program. Actually, uh, let me tell you, uh, let me use an example. This is very, so that project that I talked about, right? The, the Compounded Cell Preparations Project. We received National Science Foundation funding to find out actually what is the current state of affairs as far as compounded cell preparations in hospitals. So that's what, you know, we got the money and we traveled all around the US. We had to do 100 interviews in three months. In fact, we have to, you know, from one side, so we went to MD Anderson Medical, you know, Cancer Center in Texas. We went to the Texas Medical Center, Houston, big area, a lot of hospitals, touched a lot of hospitals there. We went to Parkland Hospital, Dallas, which is a hospital that, uh, you know, uh, late former U.S. President John F. Kennedy was taken to after he was shot. 
Um, you know, uh, we went to California, we went to Portland, Oregon, we went to Michigan, you know, Detroit Medical Center, you know, all of these medical centers, we walked in and in that pharmacy where they do all of these operations, you have a pharmacy director, sometimes we were able to contact the VP of pharmacy, you know, higher position, administrative positions, they give us a more of an administrative. So why am I mentioning this? All of these setting up, right, for meetings. I had two of my graduate students work in this project. They had to call these places, initiate a dialogue, set up an appointment. And we ourselves booked our travel flights, you know, for the stay, traveling. The students were actively involved in that process. So at the end of that project, what my graduate students said, you know, Dr. Nesamoni, this has been something that I think I would never ever have imagined happened to me, you know. First of all, here was, here's another thing. We were walking down the street um, and walked up to this main administrative building uh, in Texas Medical Center. And we were on the floor and there were a few people walking around, came up to us and why are you here for us? Like, yeah, we were trying to meet up with these folks in these, this hospital. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> she said that. <laughs> because this is not the kind of place you can go and you know get an appointment. You know, MD Anderson, the Anderson Cancer Center, number one cancer research hospital in the world. Okay, um, you know, uh, the students had to go through that challenge, <laughs> <laughs> and they did. And that they come out of that process. That's where that's where you get out of the comfort zone. You actually go out there in the field and get ripped apart, so to speak, and, you know, become a new person. I think that was a really interesting, interesting experience. And so these are the things. And then um, in, in, an, in an undergraduate program, and I, I direct, as I said, I direct the BSPS in pharmaceutics program. This summer, I'm going to have four undergrad students in my lab. What I make them do is every week, every week we have a weekly uh, research meeting they, each person will have a presentation, PowerPoint presentation to make. And they come in front of our small group, make that presentation, they get challenged. You know, we ask questions, you know, when they have something out there, I've been through this process with my advisor, you know. You know, you know initially when my first PowerPoint, I had a lot of information in there, a lot of technical jargon, all of that stuff, just to kind of impress him, right? And so, then he's like, Jerry, what does that fractal radius mean? I had this thing term fractal radius in that slide. And I was like, what the, how do I explain this? I don't even know. <laughs> I was like, why did even I put it there? And like, I'm standing in front of a group of students and he's asking me that question. And so he said, Jerry, lesson number one, do not put anything on your slide that you cannot explain. Number one. <laughs> so, Again, that was a mistake that I had to go through to have that in my mind. That was in my very first semester here uh, as a PhD student, you know. So those are instances that, uh, that I've experienced that I continue to perhaps, you know, accommodate in my, uh, uh, in my uh, teaching uh, style as well. Other than that, you know, um, there is a lot of opportunity for children. I, I think a lot of that thing comes from involvement in student organizations. Student organizations is like a big part. Like my kids in my, you know, my, 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 my son is 13 year old, my daughter is 11 year old. In their school, in their classes, they have nature club, this club, speech club, debate club, that club, all of these things, you know, um, that, in, so, so student organization activities, I think that's built in the, in the educational system. And I think that kind of, you know, um, you know, my graduate students that I have, uh, Brandon and Luke, you know, Brandon uh, is the president of the AAPS chapter. Luke is a secretary, I think. You know, they all are involved in programming and, uh, you know, meeting people and organizing events. So I think student organizations have a big role in, 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 in doing that. And, uh, you know, uh, as a faculty, I believe the, the, the leadership development programs and myself, you know, standing in front of this large group of students and, you know, uh, you know, this goes back, that question goes back to several years ago. I did a summer one week program <clears throat> uh, 
on teaching and learning at the uh, University of West Virginia, Charleston. <clears throat> and, you know, and it's so true. And I, that picture in the beginning of that small building where we operated out of that private pharmacy college uh, taught uh, in Appalachian College of Pharmacy, you know, you realize this teaching particularly, you know, you don't get any training. <laughs> You're just asked to go teach, right? I mean, see, a pilot gets a lot of training. You, you have to go through training, you know, uh, and you have to take tests and all of that. But we all kind of assume that we have these qualifications, so we are equipped to do the things that we are asked to do, <laughs> which I think is in, in, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, uh, is the wrong approach and it happens here. I mean, so I was able to participate in these events and programs and I was able to use that opportunity. Uh, and those are some of the ways that I can think of, you know, um, if there are, um, you know, now there are probably virtual programs uh, available uh, virtual communities, virtual programs, uh, you know, those are some of the positive aspects of social media. I think, you know, virtual programming uh, available through various platforms. I think LinkedIn itself, right, offers, uh, I'm not sure to what, ex what kind of uh, penetration LinkedIn has in India, uh, but LinkedIn is a really big place where some of these uh, outside of the classroom professional development occurs here in the U.S., actually. A lot of my students, my graduates, I see them like they are in my uh, contact list. And whenever, whenever you know, they have done some sort of certification program or some sort of training program, you know, they post that they have made that achievement. So I think LinkedIn is a good resource. I'm not sure, like I said, how much of that penetration is there in, 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 in India. But uh, here, that is a big thing um, through LinkedIn. And just being active, I think, and doing, uh, you know, what you are passionate about. You know, it doesn't have to be anything connected to the profession either. It could be in your community, you know, in, in, in your local area, you know, some of your friends uh, or you yeah. know, there's a group of friends doing something. Uh, yeah, I can, I can actually vouch for a, quite a lot of online programs available because my son has been looking into since he's heading the summer vacation now. If left alone, like any other teenage kid, he can go in a different tangent. So there are umpteen number of online courses free. Again, if you can pay, there are like thousands, but even free online courses, even from institutes like MIT, you know, which is the, the, the top of the top in the world, they offer a free online courses for the many different kinds of uh, topics. So those are all available. Uh, but before we uh, jump into the next, I have one question from our old friend Nisha to you, uh, Jerry. That's like, uh, in your entire career or, or the journey where you're a mentor, you're a researcher, you're a teacher, what, what are those, what is those, oh, those biggest hurdle you had? You know, and, and I would add one more thing to their hurdle, quote unquote, she's telling, uh, if you keep out some of those friends. No, no, that's just an addition for me. So just a, just tell Nisha, like, what are some of those biggest hurdles you had? Um, <clears throat> so, wow. Very, very, very good question, right? So I'll tell you, my first semester, I'm going to make educationally, <clears throat> okay? As I told you, at the end of that first semester, remember between Thanksgiving and Christmas, when that first semester was about to end, I remember calling my sister, Juno, who mm. was in Malaysia and telling her, I'm done, I'm packing, I'm coming, I'm going home, right? The biggest factor was language. Uh, and, uh, you know, at that time, I don't even, I didn't even have a cell phone at that time. Uh, so the social network and the support network that is possible now did not exist. So that was a big thing also. I think that isolation, you know, uh, that you feel, and that was particularly pronounced in me because I grew up in my home till I packed my bags and took on a, to cough on a plane to the U.S. Mm -hmm. I've never gone out of that area. I mean, let me tell you, uh, the, 
time when I really started uh, experiencing uh, the outside world was when I was a medical rep for three months for work hard before, you know, that year when I, after I finished my BFAR. So uh, in a lot of ways that those were some of the challenges, uh, you know, that first semester, you know, uh, learning wise, you know, uh, we were, we had some really tough courses in that very first semester, you know, there was an advanced statistics course, uh, there was a physical chemistry course, you know, this guy is talking about Schrodinger and Einstein and relativity. <laughs> and I, I saved my exams from that time <laughs> just so that I can, you know, I look back at those exams and I'm thinking, how did I do this? You know, how did I do this? This is, I cannot do that now if, they, if, they, if he puts that problem, asks me to do that problem. So those were some of the challenges, you know, um, uh, trying to, to be, uh, to, to, to keep up with the demands uh, required of the educational program was one thing. At the personal level, the, uh, the, the isolation, you know, the, the, uh, that, that, that you all, you know, but you, you uprooted yourself from the place that you had uh, all your connections, your family, your friends, your community, your place, and you're going to a new setting. And that was a really big, took, a, took some time uh, to, to get acquainted with. But uh, I, I, I think it, it was a strength of what I learned at home, uh, you know, when I say at home, I mean in physically in my home by the role models that I had in my family, along with, you know, the teachers. I mean, it was, it's sometimes very difficult to digest or accept some of those stringent or strict measures that were implemented or that was required of us. But um, looking back at it, it made, it made so much sense. I mean, like I said, you know, there were so many communities, so many families along that coastline that was touched by those two educational institutions, Julian Nilem and St. Savas College, Mumbai, you know, including me, you know, um, and, uh, but those all, I think, prepared me well. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and if I go back, and I think I mentioned this informally during our conversation, that we had earlier about, you know, when we had that first meeting, right? You know, apart from all of that, the family support, you know, the role models I had in my family, the education, strong foundational education that I had, apart from that, if I look at a singular moment, you know, very early on, my, 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 my Dr. Dilib mentioned that I was an avid reader. All of those books came from my uh, VSSC library, my, where my, my, my papa worked, um, you know, at that time, you know, I used to read all kinds of Shakespeare, Macbeth, you know, remember reading through that, you know, old English Macbeth, I remember reading that in a summer vacation, a lot of books, a lot of books, Ge National Geographic, popular science, popular mechanics, but I never, I had a fascination for US from very early on, uh, it got more accentuated because in pharmacy college, Goodman and Gilman, all of these books, right? Textbooks all written by these professors in, in, uh, in, uh, in the US. And you look at the products names, like, you know, Abbott, Johnson and Johnson, you know, Merck, Pfizer, you look at all those companies are all, so you had that fascination. But all the while, I never, ever, ever thought I will be able to come to the US at all. If not, one individual, Rudrak Sharan, after a summer break, I remember coming and saying, guys, there is this opportunity that we all <laughs> can look into. And I'm like, you are out of your mind. You are out of your mind. This is impossible. It is impossible. But after that, you know, Rudy, uh, Ramdas, gung ho about it, right? Let's go do it. And then I am tagging along, you know, uh, not fully committed because of the financial piece involved, commitments that are required to apply, you know, at that time, you know, the exchange rate was pretty high between rupees and dollars. And, you know, I was thinking I have to apply. They say you had to apply for 10 to 10 universities to be able to get at least one admission. As so I do the math and look at, oh, well, that's a huge amount of money, application fees. But uh, it happened. And then, as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, after B-Farm, I kind of 
fell offside. But then it got rejuvenated again when I came back to M Farm. You know, I remember there's another individual. I was on my Suzuki Samurai going back to my house in Menampulam from, from medical college on a Friday evening. And I saw Charu, an old buddy who went to college with me, B, you know, BSc physics before I did my pharmacy. He was my classmate, Charu, Charu Chandra. He was standing there and I paused the break and said hi to him. And he said, he's doing his master's in computer applications at the College of Engineering Trivandrum. And he's in that bus stop trying to get on a transport bus to go to his home, which was in Pongamur. And uh, we're standing there, it's like, yeah, computers at that time, huge demand for computer education technology in the US. He was saying, I'm thinking of continuing my education in the US. I said, that is exactly what I've been thinking too, Charu. Then we both banded together. We exchanged our phone numbers and then we got together. I used to disappear from the Fiji hostel at night and we, I would go to his house in Pongamuru and sit overnight, study for GRE and TOEFL and come back in the morning and sleep for a few hours and do the rest. And it was a time commitment and uh, that, that was necessary at that time. And then along with the fact that, you know, Dilip sir, Dr. Dilip and Ramdas, you know, was doing that project work at Sri Chitra Thirunal Institute, Dr. Chandra P. Sharma had a lot of influence on me actually. And, uh, I think all of this prepared and, you know, I think I, I digressed. Uh, the question was, what were the challenges? But, you know, but none of these challenges are, are unsurmountable. These are things that we can tackle, I think. You know, that's a professional demands. The other thing, you know, my most important challenge was in understanding people, <clears throat> actually. And it has impacted me a lot not just in my professional level, but this impacts you. When you, when, you, when you have a problem understanding people, it can impact it, your personal lives as well. So, uh, you know, these are all so important, I think. Um, but nothing that can be, that cannot be overcome. We can easily mm -hmm. overcome these things with the right Thanks. mind. Yeah. Um, but before we close or before we go for the, the next segment, uh, I have one question from, from Naveen. It is mainly to the panelists because Jerry mentioned about the community, the importance of community involvement of students and how they can show for um, not just for university applications, but that is something which inculcate quite a lot of qualities within the person. So uh, what are those opportunities in Indian schools like to get community involvement? And when I, when I think when we say community involvement, it's just not just pharmacy practice, but anything to do for students connected with community, like we used to do uh, farm, farm also, or, or yeah, something of that sort, like uh, doctors Dilip Panil and Surya Prakash, others still, or uh, what are the other opportunities what students have got in India? Yes, Amish. Uh... Actually, uh, last week, the health department people came to uh, my college mm -hmm. and they are planning to conduct a community survey on uh, the dengue problem because Etimanur area now uh, slowly reporting one, two, three cases of uh, dengue fever. So they wanted to carry on a survey on this matter. And they have conducted a small seminar in the, uh, their uh, health department hall. And they wanted the 10 students from my department. And I mm. immediately, I immediately mm. told, okay, mm. I'll be sending my 10 students. Mm. Whether they are writing the exams or not, that is irrelevant. Yeah. I'll be definitely sending 10 students. So there, these type of small, small things comes to you. But you mm. have to take up, you have to grab yeah. things. That is my point. That's a great thing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's a great example. Yeah. You know, that's, that really puts the students out in the community to deal with a problem, a health problem. And, you know, what a great way to actually train them. You know, that's, that's mm. very important. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I will add, add on that. During the first stages of this Corona, our College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Trivandrum, have prepared that handwritten solution 
by our own. Yes. We have got around thousands of liters of pure alcohol from the excise department, free of cost. And we have prepared that uh, hand rub solution mm. and supplied yeah. to the government medical college to Andro for mm. about one year, continuously. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I remember and, you telling that. Yeah. Yeah, and all the students were also involved in that, and that was a big opportunity for them. That is one aspect. And uh, second thing, I think the Kerala University of Health Sciences is planning to conduct a finishing school for the BFARM students after completion of their eighth semester. So that also will be a good opportunity for the students to know about the um, available opportunities in the world and about the uh, higher studies and all. We are planning for that. It is in the planning stage only now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Samesh, regarding this uh, community service, with this when the co <clears throat> vaccine came, vaccine came. If you remember two years back, there were a lot of issues about the efficacy of this vaccine. There was a propaganda going on that it should not be used. So uh, even the vaccines are available in the hospital, and Al Shifa is one of the hospital where it was a nodal center. So we got vaccine directly from. Uh, government, but patients were not coming. Then the hospital involved or farmed these students. Uh, they uh, acted as a volunteers, no pay. Volunteers and they really counseled the patients, counseled the public. They went around and they did a wonderful job. Later on, those uh, team also got a uh, certificate from the government. Government, uh, that is a GH of Perindal Manda. Really, it was, uh, I was also there at that time. I was also there. At that time, it was very scary. COVID means it was very scary. And involving the student means parent will ask so many questions to us. Why are you involving? Yeah. Why should the, why you are uh, exposing my daughter or son, mm -hmm. right? If what if something happens to her, what you will do? Like so many questions. At that time, students came forward, supported by our team, faculties, and also hospital. And they did a wonderful job. It was a great community service I can talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I urge students who are hearing these to, uh, to really work on this one, reach out to your uh, teachers and understand these opportunities. As Dr. Anil mentioned, it's all about identifying the opportunities and grabbing them because this will, uh, th that's one of the key message from, uh, from jury as well. How you... Uh, make your overall development better. It's not just about the degrees or the pass mark, like Dr. Dilip was talking, you want to achieve, but it's about the overall development. Get your focus in your in, in spite of the chaos out around. And that's how you plan to go ahead. So uh, thank you so much from my side. But before that, I pass on to a vote of thanks now to uh, initially to, to our student rep, uh, Ms. Najia Ibrahim, and after that, we can move forward further. Over to you, Najia. Now that we have come to the end of the session, indeed, it's my pleasure to extend a heartfelt thanks to you, sir, on behalf of the whole Al Shifa family for not only sparing your uh, invaluable time for us, but also for enlightening us with your commendable talk on the subject. Thanks a lot for clearing all our concepts. We owe you a lot, sir. I also thank the COPS Global for giving us such a wonderful session and bringing us an eminent speaker like Professor Jerry, uh, who now has become an inspiration for all of us in working towards our goal. Thank you, uh, Professor Jerry, and thanks COPS Global for giving us such a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, Najia. I also invite uh, Prashant, who is a professor and HOD of Department of Pharmaceutical Analysis, Al Shifa College of Pharmacy, our I would say, come in, Prashad. Good evening, all. Good evening, all. Before, uh, it's a, such a honor for me to thank Professor Jerry for giving such a wonderful uh, speech. Uh, before that, I will say one thing. And when he was studying in the PG in college itself, he was an accredited student. What I would say, an accredited student means. He was having a vision and he set his mission. That is what. That is the path he followed uh, from that corpse to Jodhidori University. 
so so uh, this one hour is not enough for him to deliver whatever things he uh, gained in this uh, 20 20 25 years hmm? uh, yeah he was just Uh, showing some research and I'll see i know one, one one sentence in that research that slide is causing much much he did in um, worked on that uh, he just showed that uh, research mm-hmm. and all uh, and uh, he, uh, <laughs> that's all that's all uh, an excellent uh, we need some workshop from him actually we need some workshop from him so that see uh, today actually i'll tell on thing today uh, in uh, in this part in malabar part and all most of the students could not enter this uh, because they are in fasting and this is the fast breaking time mm-hmm. so most of the students i uh, they uh, message me see we will watch this surely in batch ways or in class ways we'll watch this after they break the fasting and all uh, so from batch i say i got a message so uh, jerry has given uh, a set a set of thing that how he uh, started from cops at his college of pharmacy and how he reached delhi university that that is itself a great thing that is a motivation or inspiration for the students his story will be an inspiration for so on part of cops global i thank you uh, jerry uh, for giving such a insight uh, about your career as well as what uh, what is a profession uh, of pharmacy in usa and what pharm d students are doing what is research all these things he uh, what uh, he clarified in one hour that is that is very important time hmm? one hour he clarified so if anyone wants more details definitely is going to give a broad class of workshop on that i'm, I'm sure uh, then uh, coming to uh, suri prakash sir you know shiva college was merely what they were having we were having a, a building we were having some academics but as i mentioned lecture is a uh, vision and mission sir also set a vision and mission in our college and and, and that the, as a result of that uh, many of the accreditation a lot of us came to college so starting from my year so then we went for nba which is a specific b farm course accreditation we got a nba then nac accreditation so we have so many accreditation in the college so we were the pioneer in kerala to get such an accreditation for pharmacy colleges so because of him only we achieved all this i should, i should say he was a captain or he was a strength behind that he was very instrumental in bringing this accreditation to our college so i must thank, thank him on behalf of cops global for associating with us and giving his valuable suggestion on this uh, webinar thank you sir then coming to anil sir he is actually the head of uh, pharmaceutics in uh, cpas uh, that is uh, earlier it was called mg university we used to say mg university pharmacy college now uh, the name has changed that means their vision also changed that means they are a professional and advanced study bodies that means he is uh, is giving such an insight into this uh, research papers and about pharmaceutics a lot of things a lot of happenings just like what the us is happening he is having so many happenings in that uh, institute and he is also giving a uh, wonderful uh, effort to bring that caps into limelight thank you sir for associating with the cops global and on behalf of uh, uh, self and the cops global thank you uh, for being part of it the dilip sir is our actually dilip sir is a part of cops global he is a Uh, secretary of our association or cops global and uh, he, today he has changed the gear and he has been what uh, is a in the panelist because uh, jerry will be discussing because he's very close to jerry and uh, they have a lot of stories and <laughs> all these things are that's why we prefer him in the panelist because when they join together we will get more stories and about or how they did uh, as uh, jerry was mentioning the those two purpose uh he was mentioning those two purpose he was behind that the dilip sir was behind that and uh, yes you know so to jerry's career dilip sir uh, is having he is bearing a toss like for that uh, i should uh, say proudly that dilip sir has given some insights into Jerry, jerry's vision and all definitely so thank you dilip sir for being the panelist then coming to uh, najia she was a uh, student representative because alshifa is a uh, today's part as a partner and uh, energy has given a role thank you energy and finally i thank all the participants 
uh, uh, share their questions, their queries, uh, and, and uh, being a part of this webinar. Thank you, Ananda. Thank you, Prashant. This is this is awesome. The the close knit <clears throat> community we have here. Uh, every time, again and again, on webinars, we are getting better. Uh, I really hope students are also finding that and they are getting what they what matters to them, what interests to them. If you have further comments, viewers, please do let me know because our ultimate aim is to give you what you really want rather than tell you what we know. If you don't know, we don't know, but the, the gist is you should be benefiting out of it. So please keep us informed on those. Uh, we really want to continue this, this fantastic opportunity to build up this small community and, and benefit everyone. Thank you so much again to one and all and, and have the best rest of the day. And you three have the next best of the day today. The weekend is getting over, but again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks.